Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He has served on the Secretary of the Navy's Advisory Committee on Naval History and has received the U.S. Navy's Meritorious Civilian Service Award and Superior Sil Civilian Service Award. A Senior Research Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, he is a member of the Editorial Board of Orbis, a Journal of World Affairs, and the Academic Board of Advisors of the Churchill Center. He is Associate Editor of Diplomacy and Statecraft. Dr. Maurer is the author or editor of numerous books, including The Outbreak of the First World War, Military Intervention in the Third World, and Churchill and the Strategic Dilemmas Before the World Wars. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Maurer. I want to begin by offering my added voice to the chorus of thanking Hillsdale for inviting me to be here today as a speaker, to Larry Arn for inviting me, and also to all of the Hillsdale family community for being so hospitable and making me feel, have such a warm welcome here my first time at Hillsdale. I was asked to talk about Churchill as a war leader. And what I want to do is take us back 75 years in time to 1940. 1940, as you know, was one of the great turning points in world history. What a dramatic year that was. History, if it had gone another way, as it could have, history could have gone terribly awry in a hideous way. As it was, World War II was hideous enough, but it could have been worse. We can imagine how much worse it could have been. And so what I want to do today is talk about Churchill at a critical moment in world history. The period for which he is most celebrated, deservedly so. So I want to take us back to 1940 and those events. Now, you heard already about Churchill's early life. And in my early life, he wrote and said, well, adults called me a troublesome boy. Here he is as a teenager. Does he look like a troublesome boy to you? Well, uh, fast forward 50 years. You, you can see there uh, that that troublesome teenage boy was also going to be a troublesome 60-something to Adolf Hitler. Again, what makes great leaders? How far does it go back to what are those formative experiences that you heard about as a young man that led him to be a great, great leader? Whoop, I didn't mean to do that. Question. Here's a question for you. What if Churchill had not been there? This is what historians and political scientists call counterfactual analysis. We know the history, but let's imagine alternative histories. What if he had not been there? This is what I like to call the George Bailey effect. <laughs> we all remember that famous movie by Frank Capra with Jimmy Stewart, where George Bailey has to see a life of his town, his small town, if he didn't live. That alternative future. And what could have happened? It would have been Potterville, a horrible place to live. Not the type of community you want your family to grow up in. And so what we want to do is think about the alternatives of what if Churchill had not been there. That's one of the great measures of a leader. Imagine if that leader had not been there to make some critical decision. Well, Churchill might not have been there, because in 1931 in New York City, he was hit by a car on Fifth Avenue. He was almost killed. In fact, someone of a weaker constitution could well have died from that auto accident. Fortunately for him, he had very good medical care. 
Dr. Otto Pickard, who wrote out this prescription for him. Let me read it for you. Remember, this is, this is the United States during Prohibition. So Dr. Otto Pickhart wrote out, this is to certify that the post-accident convalescence of the Honorable Winston S. Churchill necessitates the use of alcoholic spirits, especially at mealtimes. The quantity is naturally indefinite, but the minimum requirements would be 250 cubic centimeters. We all wish we had doctors like this. And we wish that our health insurance would cover these prescriptions. Oh, well. Again, imagine if he had died in 1931 in New York. Now, typical of Churchill, here's something, great adversity. He's been punished by the gods. He's been hit by a car. He almost dies. Many people hit by such adversity would be down and out. But instead, what did Churchill do? He wrote about his experience, about being hit by a car, my New York misadventure, for which he was paid a great deal of money. Here he took adversity and turned it around to good fortune. Indeed, that's a hallmark of Churchill in 1940, that despite the great catastrophe of the defeats in France in 1940, he took those defeats and that adversity and turned it around dramatically and laid the foundation for the grand alliance that would go on to defeat Hitler's tyranny. Well, what caused the great Second World War? Well, there's the Great War. It's the aftermath of the Great War, the First World War, but also the Great Depression. The Great Depression becomes one of the major undercurrents that leads to the radicalization of politics around the world that leads to the Second Great Armageddon, as Churchill called it. The New York that Winston Churchill saw in 1931, this is what you would see. If you go to YouTube, you can see the film footage of this. Look at these men looking for a handout, beaten down. They're not looking at the camera, they're looking at their feet. And when you see the film footage, you see they're shuffling along like this. These are hungry men who have been broken. Their respect has been taken away, as well as being hungry. This is what the great man-made catastrophe called the Great Depression, that the world dealt with. Now, countries dealt with it in different ways. What you see here is a transmission belt toward war. The economic downturn led to the radicalization of politics, failed democratic states, principally in Germany. The economic downturn led to the radicalization of politics, failed democratic states, principally in Germany and in Japan. The 1920s had seen democracy, more open forms of government in both countries. The Great Depression, though, radicalized nationalist movements in both countries that then in turn, that seized power, that then in turn led to a more aggressive foreign policy on the part of both Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. So the economic downturn leads in time to another great war. Well, who was one of the beneficiaries of this downturn? Adolf Hitler and his extremist nationalist movement within Germany came to power on January 30th, 1933. Look at this creepy photograph. What do you see here? You see Der Fuhrer, you see Hitler. He has his hands on that young man, that boy, that 12-year-old. What do you think, he's about 12? Yes, look at that. We know the future of this young boy, don't we? He's probably going to be killed over Britain or die on the Russian front because they're following their Fuhrer, their leader, who's leading them to catastrophe. One of the hallmarks of the Nazi movement was that it was a youth movement. It attracted the youth of Germany. That came across in the film clip that Richard Langworth did of Sir Robert Hardy's film on the wilderness years. Uh, the Nazi movement was appealing to young people who felt disenfranchised, who didn't think they had a place 
Think about this. This generation is blighted in so many ways. They grow up in the shadow of the Great War. When they come of age, no jobs because of the Great Depression. Meanwhile, who have they lost? Their father, older brother, uncles? Male figures that could give stability to their life have been taken away on the trenches of the Western Front. This young generation is looking for someone to lead them, and this is who they found. This Pied Piper, it's like a grim fairy tale here, hijacking, taking away the youth of Germany, leading them to the battlefields of the Second World War. Well, in Hamlet, as you've heard, Shakespeare formed an important part of Churchill's uh, upbringing, background, understanding of life. Well, King Claudius says, hey, madness and great ones must not unwatch and go. Did, did I do that well, Sir Robert? Uh, the, the, my delivery? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you have to watch. We might find Hitler's views so extreme to be mad, but that madness is a reality that you have to deal with. Unfortunately, in the world we live in today, we look at enemies and extremists and we say, we can't believe that they believe the things they do. But they do. And we have to live with them. We have to understand them. We have to think that we might not be able to change them. You're not going to change an Adolf Hitler. You're going to have to live with those views, though, or destroy those views. Well, in Germany, Churchill saw what was happening. Mass movements, again, look at the young people here mobilized at all these various German rallies, the Buchberger at Nuremberg. And Churchill early on highlighted, what do you see here in Germany? Parliamentary democracy, the Weimar Republic, that's gone. It's been swept away. And look at this wonderful language. What's in its place? You have a dictatorship, but not just any dictatorship. You have a most grim dictatorship. Boy, that's right out of Hamlet, too. It's not just murder most, murder, it's murder most foul, right? Well, here you have a dictatorship, but a most grim dictatorship. You can see Shakespeare influencing Churchill's rhetoric here. Well, what is at stake? Churchill lays this out in the great speeches of the 1930s. And here's his famous Munich oration condemning the Munich Pact. He's laying out that this is an ideological struggle, as he says, a conflict of spiritual and moral ideals. He highlights you have to consider what the Nazi movement stands for. You have to consider that. You have to understand them. And what does Nazi power stand for? Spurns Christian ethics. Cheers barbarous paganism. Vaunts the spirit of aggression derives strength and pleasure from persecution. Nazi power uses pitiless brutality and the threat of murderous force. The bottom line, the thesis is, Nazi Germany and British democracy, they can't ever be friends. This is an existential struggle right at the heart of Europe. One or the other is going to have to go. Churchill understands the danger that Britain and indeed all of Western civilization faces from the Nazi challenge. Well, how do you respond to it? Churchill says we have to have weapons, armaments. And so early on, early on, he called for a buildup of British air power. So in 1934, you have him saying, we ought to double the Royal Air Force as fast as we can, and we ought to have it now, and then double it again. Now his critics said, this is extreme. This is going to bust the budget. We don't want to do that. This is alarmist panic mongering. Don't want to do that. But Churchill calls for rearmament to become stronger, to be able to face the coming storm posed by the Nazi threat. But in addition, Churchill wants to reach out and find allies, not only armaments, but find allies. And one of the great allies that he wants to reach out to is the United States. Here's a speech in the aftermath of Munich in the fall of 1938 that he gave over the NBC radio network to the United States. And as you can see here, uh, what uh, Richard uh, talked about, 
the way in which his speeches were laid out, that he would memorize them but would read from them and also make editorial changes in them too, down to the last uh, minute. Now, what does it say? Well, we must arm. Britain and America must arm. But arms aren't enough. Weapons aren't enough. Instead, Britain and the United States have to add the power of ideas. A conflict is not just about weapons. It's about people and what motivates people. Do they have the will to fight? Not just the means to fight, but the will to fight. And so Churchill is trying to highlight what is at stake, not just to the British public, but also in the United States, reaching out to the United States to highlight that the fight against Nazi Germany is not just one between Britain and Germany, but the U.S. will be involved in this fight as well. Now, of course, you live in a democracy. If I put forward a proposition, there's going to be someone who disagrees with me. And in the United States, one of the most powerful figures, the great press magnate William Randolph Hearst, uh, didn't like Churchill's message. So this is his response in an editorial, that this is propaganda. It's flooding the United States. The propaganda shrewd, ablest statesman, meaning Churchill. And Churchill is wrong wrong about what is at stake for America in this coming fight. By the way, a measure of a leader is not only, you know, what, what, or what you do, you know, how, how, uh, what if you're not there, but also another measure of a leader is how much respect do your enemies have for you? What do your enemies think of you? Are they afraid of you or not? Well, Early on, Hitler understood that Churchill was a danger, that a Briton under Churchill is a more dangerous Briton than a Briton under Stanley Baldwin. And indeed, that very same speech to America, broadcast to America, Hitler went out of his way in November of 1938 to offer a response to Churchill. Now notice what he says here. Churchill has said that it's a spiritual moral conflict between democracy and Nazi tyranny. Hitler's response is to say, there's been formed this custom, he calls it a curious custom, of dividing people into authoritarian states. Now notice the dash, that is disciplined states and democratic states. The implication being that democracies aren't disciplined. Indeed, many of us at times think, I wish we could all get on the same page and agree. Well, Hitler's highlighting here, this is a weakness of democracy. Uh, that authoritarian states, by being more rigid and disciplined, everyone can get into line. Not understanding the strength of democracies, that very openness also brings in participation. But again, notice he sees a struggle here too between democracy and the Nazi regime. Now, in his speeches, Churchill hoped that within Germany there would be a movement to overthrow the Nazi regime. Well, Hitler takes this head on. And you can YouTube this as well and listen to this speech. And when he says Mr. Churchill in German, it's Herr Churchill. I mean, you can hear it, the anger in his voice, just when he mentions Churchill's name. He says the present regime should be overthrown in Germany. Well, Churchill's spending too much of his time with traitors, Hitler says, that are living abroad in England and the rest. And he should realize that that's well, madness, stupidity. Again, to Churchill, who would appear to be living on the moon. There's no force in Germany that will turn against the present regime. Alas, Hitler's probably right here. At this time, the opposition is broken. By the fall of 1938, Hitler's successes in rearmament and bringing about full employment, his foreign policy successes has broken down and beaten down whatever opposition does exist in Germany to the regime. The regime is popular. Well, is there a better way than Churchill's way? And of course, we associate this with Neville Chamberlain, a man devoted to peace striving his best to preserve the peace, understanding that another great war between the great powers would be like the first war. It would produce massive casualties and social upheaval. It should be avoided at all costs. War should be a last resort. Should find some way out of that. There has to be a better way. Well, he was trying to find a moderate Nazi. 
And he thought he found that moderate Nazi in Hitler at Munich. Again, writing to his sister, one of his sisters, Ida, he said, hey, I've established a confidence with Hitler. And in spite of that hardness, ruthlessness, again, before his eyes, he can see that Hitler is a ruthless man. But he's somebody, well, once he's given his word, he'll stick with it. Well, we know fat chance about that. But come home, this is what you're greeted by, peace. This is popular at the time when he comes back. Indeed, Neville Chamberlain thought about holding a snap election because he thought his own personal popularity and the Tories would be so great that they would be able to win a big election. He was talked out of it, though. But nonetheless, Chamberlain is seen as the man who has preserved the peace. And we've seen these photographs before of him returning back to England, holding in his hand a piece of paper signed by him and by Adolf Hitler. You can see Hitler's scroll there above Neville Chamberlain's name. As Chamberlain was leaving Germany, he put this document in front of Hitler and said, please sign this. And Hitler didn't want to sign it as soon as it was translated for him and he could see it, but he felt he couldn't at that point, that it would ruin uh, what had happened at the Munich Agreement. So he, he signed it, but afterwards he complained bitterly about having to sign this old man forcing him to sign this document. But again, the key is right there in the center of it, the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Again, who can be against peace? Well, of course, it's Adolf Hitler. He's against peace. He wants a war. He felt very frustrated by Munich. He wanted it to go to war in 1938. Well, a year later, he's going to get his war because, as he said to his intimates, those in his entourage, like Joseph Goebbels, he said, if that old man comes interfering again, meaning Neville Chamberlain with his umbrella, what am I going to do? I'm just going to kick him downstairs and jump on his tummy in front of the photographers. Look at the contempt that Hitler has for Neville Chamberlain, unlike the fear he has for Churchill. Well, a year later, in August of 1939, uh, Hitler gets his way by joining up with Stalin, Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. Hitler and Stalin are able to get together to trigger the next great Armageddon, World War. Again, what do they have in common? They want to tie up, tear up the Versailles settlement. They want to partition Eastern Europe between them. And so in 1939, September, German invasion of Poland from the west. Meanwhile, from the east, the Red Army goes into Poland and seizes Polish territory as well. This is the trigger for the war. Britain goes to war, and of course, Winston is back. Neville Chamberlain brings him back into his government as First Lord of the Admiralty with a seat in the War Cabinet. Again, picture post, him going to the Admiralty building, being in charge of the Navy. Again, a poster from the time that the Navy guards the freedom of us all. Well, what was the response in Germany to the news that Churchill is back in the government after being out of government for 10 years? Well, Albert Speer, who later became Hitler's armaments minister, kept a diary. And he was there when the news broke in Germany of what happened. He was outside Hitler's salon, Hitler's uh, uh, rooms, when out came Hermann Goering. Goering steps out, sits down, frustrated. He, he drops down wearily and says, Churchill in the cabinet. That means the war is really on. Now we shall have war with England. It was hoped by Hitler that even if Britain declared war on Germany, they wouldn't do very much, and soon there would be a negotiation to bring an end to the fighting. But the news of Churchill in the government dashed all those hopes. Hitler and the top leadership understood that Churchill in the government meant there was a fight to the finish. Again, the measure of a leader is how do your enemies assess you? Well, Poland taken out. What's Germany's next move? Well, in the spring of 1940, it's to go conquer Denmark, Norway, to protect German iron ore supplies from Sweden. Well, the campaign of Britain and France in Norway did not go well. There were military setbacks. The Germans gained the upper hand. This triggered a debate in the spring of 1940 
that would lead to Churchill coming to power. Now, there were no photographs that were supposed to be taken in the House of Commons, no recordings of the speeches in the House of Commons, but nonetheless, someone was able to sneak a, a, a camera in to take a picture of the debate. And there you see Churchill and Neville Chamberlain sitting on the front bench together in the government, listening to the debate as it goes on in the House of Commons. Well, as a result of this debate, Chamberlain holds on, wins, but he realizes that he can't go on as prime minister, that a coalition government has to be formed of all parties in this national emergency triggered by these military defeats up in Norway. Neville Chamberlain leaving as prime minister. Now our ambassador to the court of St. James was Joseph Kennedy, the father of President John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy was very close to Neville Chamberlain, and in fact, in their views, very similar. They were both wanted to appease Germany, to avoid war at all costs. And this is what uh, Kennedy, who kept a diary of his time, uh, recorded about Chamberlain, how broken he was. Well, who's going to become prime minister if Chamberlain sets down? Who well, becomes Churchill or Lord Halifax, Britain's foreign secretary? That's what the choice is. Well, between the two of them, uh, Halifax had the inside track. Conservative Party wanted him. Neville Chamberlain wanted him. The royal family would have been content with him to be Prime Minister. The Labour Party was willing to serve under him. Uh, there was one problem, though. Lord Halifax didn't want to be Prime Minister. He confided to his diary that the whole thought of being Prime Minister at this crisis time made his stomach upset. Well, a weak tummy means that he's not going to be prime minister. He could have been prime minister if he wanted to be, but he turned it down. And as a consequence, we got Winston Churchill. Don't you love this photograph, the pinstripe suit, the cigar, the Tommy gun? Wow, this is great. This is pugnacious. Of course, Joseph Goebbels, Dr. Goebbels, he used this for his propaganda to highlight, because one of the German propaganda lines is that Winston Churchill is a gangster, some Chicago gangster like Al Capone. Uh, you know, there he is. He, well, he looks like a gangster. Uh, but again, I love that pugnacious Churchill there with the Tommy gun. Well, what's Germany's next move? It's an offensive to the West. The Western Front had been quiet, all quiet on that Western Front from September 1939 to May 1940. But in May 1940, just as Churchill is becoming Prime Minister, the big German offensive begins on the Western Front. Uh, spearheaded by air power, German air power that Churchill had warned against, Germany gets air superiority over the battlefield, which enables its armored forces, infantry forces, artillery, what we call combined arms forces, be able to launch breakthroughs Indeed, the major breakthrough occurs along the Meuse River. It cuts off the British, French, and Belgian forces in the north in Belgium. And it becomes a real horse race to see whether the British and French forces can escape out through the Channel ports before that German, what they called sickle cut, that German sickle cut comes through and envelops and destroys the British and French forces. Well, this is a desperate situation to be in. Dunkirk becomes the port. We've seen these photographs and newsreels of the evacuation of Dunkirk. It was thought at the time, the British chief said, we'll be fortunate to get 30,000 soldiers out. In other words, the whole British expeditionary force and the French armies in Belgium are going to be wiped out. They're going to be destroyed. But, as Churchill said, through a miracle of deliverance and a great deal of hard fighting, instead of 30,000, more than 300,000, 10 times the number, were able to escape. Again, it might have been a miracle of deliverance, but as Churchill warned, wars are not won by evacuation. Well, after Dunkirk, the Germans turned south to occupy and defeat the rest of the French army and overrun France. German forces going into Paris, Hitler visiting Paris, well, in this situation of these defeats on the battlefield, uh, Lord Halifax, who still remained as foreign secretary in the coalition government, he was known as the English parson. He was a very religious, very devout man. He starts to argue that this catastrophic defeat that is occurring 
to the British and French forces means that the chances of defeating Nazi Germany have sunk dramatically. And the result is that Britain and France ought to be trying to find a deal, to cut a deal, to cut their losses before they become, suffer even a worse defeat at the hands of the Nazis. He argued in the cabinet for what was called realism, that the British government should be realistic in assessing their chances of victory, that the probability of success was low. He argued in this that they had to face the fact that trying to bring about the complete defeat of Germany, regime change, the overthrow of the Nazi regime, well, that wasn't going to happen. And indeed, Britain should be looking to safeguard its empire. And that Britain should be open to any negotiation that would lead to, as he said, the liberty and independence of the British Empire. Now, Lord Halifax is not calling for surrender. What he's arguing for is Germany, the reality is they've won in Europe. Let them have their hegemony in Europe in return for safeguarding the British Empire. Maybe Malta has to be given up to Mussolini and the Italians, or, but cut some sort of deal to preserve the British Empire. Otherwise, if the war continues, the British Empire will be destroyed. That's what Halifax is arguing at the time. Well, Churchill would have none of it, and he argued against Halifax in closed meetings of the British government. Uh, indeed, after one of the meetings, he went in and talked to the cabinet and gave an oration to the cabinet. Uh, and, he, and, he, and this is what he said to them, that, you know, hey, I'd be convinced that you would tear me down. I've just become prime minister. But if I were to contemplate parley with the Germans, and then look at this, and this Long Island story of ours is to end at last, let it end only when each one of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. Wow. Wow, powerful. You know what the cabinet's response was? Hooray! That's what we want to hear. They backed up Churchill. They wanted to keep fighting. Halifax recorded in his diary, well, Winston talked the most frightful rot. It drives him to despair. Churchill's driven by emotion. That previous oration to the cabinet, it's emotion driving Churchill when he ought to have his brain thinking, reasoning. The reasonable person would try to cut a deal at this time. Indeed, revisionist historians, when writing about Churchill, say that Churchill might have made the right decision in 1940 to fight on, but it wasn't based on reason, it was all based on emotion. I'm going to argue against that. Yes, there's great emotion involved. Of course there is. They're involved in a war, a struggle for survival. People are indeed emotional in those situations. They're fighting for something that they care dearly about. But that doesn't mean that the brain was turned off at that time. Churchill is also offering good and reasoned arguments for why to fight on. Well, rumors of divisions in the British government get back to Germany. And indeed, Dr. Goebbels is confiding to his diary, the war is going to come to an end soon. By the end of June, the German leadership thinks there's a chance for a negotiated peace with Britain. The Churchill will be removed from government, he'll be replaced by somebody else, and that new government will be willing to negotiate with Germany. They're close to the end of the war. Well, Churchill's response is pretty clear. And again, the speeches are not just to the British people, but also to the enemy, to show resolve. In one of his great speeches, he highlights that if Britain is invaded, the British people won't just lie down in submission. They'll fight. They'll defend every village, every town, every city. Indeed, London itself can be turned into a vast fortress if it's fought out. Again, think of the Battle of Stalingrad and the battles of the Second World War that had been fought in cities. Here Churchill is imagining this. This is also an implicit dig at the French because the French declared Paris an open city not to be fought over in 1940. Unlike in 1871 when Paris underwent a siege in the Franco-Prussian War. So Churchill is saying, we're not going to behave like that. We're going to fight it out in the cities. And then again, look at this line. I'm bound to state these facts to our people, to inform them and to reassure them. And again, you, a bloodthirsty speech like that, you would think that would frighten people, but it doesn't. It shows that the leadership is determined to see things through. Well, Hitler has a response. 
Today, historians do not pay enough attention to Hitler's speeches. They should be read. It is amazing how revealing these speeches are of Hitler. He's not keeping things secret. He's telling people what he thinks. And so in response to Churchill's speech, he comes out with his so-called peace appeal of July 19, 1940. Mr. Churchill declares he wants the war to continue. A great empire will be destroyed. I don't want to destroy it. Again, I want to cut a deal to preserve the British Empire. But it's clear that this struggle will end in the destruction of one or two if Churchill is remaining in power. Churchill thinks that it will be Germany. I'll know it. it's England. Again, look at this. At this hour, I feel compelled by conscience. Hitler's conscience. How big is that? Small, pretty, okay. Appeal to reason in England. Again, here it is. He's appealing to reason in England that Churchill's decisions are emotional rather than based on prudence, on care, in a careful way, thinking through odds, probabilities, strengths of both sides. Well, why make peace? Uh, a good argument could be made for why to make peace. Here's the arguments that were made at the time. They're actually quite compelling. They're very strong uh, reasons. Again, if you're sitting there in 1940 and you're looking at the future, well, France, your main allies defeated. The British Army's been disarmed. Italy and Japan are going to come in against you. Again, uh, it, it looks pretty bleak. These are the arguments that are being raised at the time. And again, in this emotional environment, arguments are being put forward, and Churchill is answering them. Indeed, in one of his famous speeches from 1940, he says, we have good and reasonable hopes for final victory. Now, why did he believe that? Well, this is his counter-argument, that Britain could build up its air power, defend the homeland with its air power, build up a big bomber force to take the fight to Germany. It can defend its sea lanes. It can carry out offensives in the Middle East against Italy, support insurgencies in Europe, and eventually work toward an alliance with the United States. What's key here is that the decision for Britain to fight on is based on a wager that Churchill is making, a bet that he is making, that the United States will come through ultimately and see this fight against Nazi Germany as a fight that the United States also has to fight. Again, this is key. This is a big takeaway. My students like to use the phrase, a takeaway. What can you learn from history? Well, here's something that I think is a very powerful lesson. For our partners around the world, their decisions about how to behave in their foreign policy is predicated upon their reading of the United States and our willingness to back them up. I think that's a very powerful takeaway that we should always keep in mind. Well, in the First World War, Churchill served as Ministry of Munitions in Britain. Uh, Dr. Larry Arn has a wonderful study that he's written about Churchill as Minister of Munitions. And in one of his speeches in the First World War, Churchill said, how is Britain going to win the First World War against Imperial Germany? Two A's. Airplanes in America. There's a great deal of continuity between Churchill's views in the First World War and the Second World War. This is what he's arguing later on in 1940, that the United States is going to tip the balance so that the complete defeat of Germany can be accomplished. By the way, Churchill just doesn't make decisions on his own. He goes to the British Chiefs of Staff, and here's the staff paper that was laid out, and it's called British Strategy in a Certain Eventuality. This is from the end of May. That certain eventuality is that France is going to fold and won't continue the fight and will surrender to Germany. And what the British chiefs argue in this, because Churchill says, what are, what are our chances of holding on? And the chiefs come back and say, hey, we can continue to fight if the United States gives us that economic and financial support. But, big caveat, if they don't have that support from the United States, then we do not think we could continue the war with any chance of success. Again, the United States' role is key in 1940. Will the U.S. come through? And the other big unknown, big question mark is, will the British people be able to withstand an aerial assault, a bombing campaign against them? 
This is a big question mark. Leaders and the great powers didn't know whether their populace, their peoples, how they would react to being attacked from the air. Well, Churchill's great speech, finest hour, that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. And what's at stake? Nothing less than the survival of Christian civilization, an existential fight at the heart of Western civilization. The stakes are high, and Hitler knows that he's got to throw everything at Britain if he has any chance to continue the war. Sir Robert Hardy talked about this, the sunlit uplands again, the language of Churchill that proves so inspiring. Notice again in this famous Finest Hour speech, he highlights that the whole world is in danger, including the United States. The United States might feel secure in the Western Hemisphere, but it won't be secure in a world dominated by these authoritarian, disciplined states. And again, this new dark age, because science and technology, you know, one of the questions raised at lunchtime for Richard about 50 years hence, what role does technology play? Well, technology in the hands of evil men can lead to great wickedness. Uh, brace themselves for this fight, and it'll be known as their finest hour. Well, here's the British response. It's no longer peace. It's we will never surrender. I love this David Lowe cartoon. Look at this cartoon. Look what it shows. It shows British political leaders, Churchill at the front of this phalanx. Behind him, Neville Chamberlain, Clement Attlee, Beaverbrook, Halifax, Leo Amory, Eden. I, the British politicians all lined up. And notice what's happened. They've taken off their jackets. They've rolled up their sleeves. This is a bare knuckles fight. No Marquis de Queensberry rules here. This is a real bloody fight that's going to happen. And look, all behind you, Winston. The country's united in this bare-knuckle fight. Well, the Straits of Dover are not very wide, are they? Here's Goering and his entourage, the Air Force, German Air Force, looking across at the white cliffs of Dover. Great danger. Can Britain stand up to this air assault? Indeed, the German Air Force is ready to give it a try. Dr. Goebbels, in fact, commissions a song, Bombs on England. You can go to YouTube and hear it if you want to. But here are some of the lyrics. The German pilots are pumped. Their morale is high. They want to destroy the British Empire. Again, that generation that grew up, what did they remember from the First World War? The hunger blockade of Britain. They were hungry as young people. Why? Because of the British blockade. There's great hatred of Britain in Germany. And Goebbels is playing this up. So you have highly motivated German Air Force trying to take the fight to be in the vanguard to destroy the British Empire. And again, the refrain is bombs, bombs, bombs on England. Well, will Britain be able to stand up to it? Our ambassador, Joseph Kennedy, wrote to his son, JFK, in August, the whole crux of the matter is this air battle. If the Germans can come over and knock off the British Royal Air Force, well, then the Germans will be able to carry out an invasion of Britain. And that no country can stand up to another country if it loses air superiority. It's the crux of the fight. Look at that young JFK there, by the way. It's important to remember that the Battle of Britain of 1940 was not the first Battle of Britain. In the First World War, Britain was bombed by German Zeppelins and heavy bombers. And indeed, during the First World War, the British erected air defenses against the German bomber campaign. Throughout the whole interwar period, they also looked to the danger of a renewed air assault in the British homeland. So the British were preparing for this over a generation. They understood that what happened in the First World War could happen again. So Britain is prepared to a remarkable degree, more than any other country, to be able to defend their homeland from air attack. Uh, and in charge of the British defenses is Air Marshal uh, Sir Hugh Downing, the, the, really the best commander to be in charge of this particular fight. Very cautious commander, uh, one that is uh, quite good at defending, standing on the defense. And we know about the dogfights and the battle taking place over Britain. Churchill's famous words about how the whole world war how the fate of Western civilization 
hinges on the actions of a few thousand pilots fighting it out over, over the British homeland. Now, how close a run thing was the Battle of Britain? I mean, that's a question that historians argue. Today, the consensus is that it actually wasn't such a close thing. And uh, what you see here is the table of single-engine fighter uh, aircraft. And during this attrition battle in the air over Britain, the British Royal Air Force in single-engine fighter pilot strength gets stronger over the battle. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, gets weaker. Uh, during this battle, Britain's winning it and getting stronger as the fight goes on. The odds of Germany uh, invading Britain then are actually quite low. And then, of course, once you get into the winter weather, the fall weather, an invasion becomes impossible because of the, uh, the weather. Now, that doesn't mean, however, that the bomber can't get through. And indeed, the German bombers did get through. Here's a frightening picture, a German HE-111 two-engine bomber flying over the Thames River, over the heart of London in daylight, dropping bombs on the East End. And this iconic photograph, of course, of St. Paul's Cathedral, the East End being engulfed, the city being engulfed by fire. This is Bristol in the spring of 1941, a poor area being bombed. Again, who do you see there? Of course, Churchill, his wife Clementine. Clementine is there with, with him. Again, Churchill, this is a photograph taken on September 11th, 1940, Buckingham Palace being bombed. Uh, when I see these photographs, I think about our September 11th in 2001. The amount of damage that Germany is doing to Britain from the late summer to the end of the calendar year 1940, in other words, late summer through the fall, early winter of 1940, is that 25,000 British civilians, non-combatants, are killed by German bombing. Put that on the scale of September 11, 2001. In other words, Britain is taking a punishment, the equivalent over several months, of seven or eight September 11th attacks. Again, a great deal of damage is being do, done to Britain, but yet Britain's will is not broken by that type of assault on their homeland. The House of Commons being destroyed in the spring of 41. Again, when I look at this photograph, I think about our September 11th experience, that fourth airliner. Where was that going? Was it going to the White House, to Capitol Hill? We don't know. But we do know one thing, the bravery of the people who were on that airliner. When they got on that airliner that day, they didn't think they were fighting for their life or fighting to preserve some national monument and to save the lives of thousands of others, and yet that's what they did. Just think how heroic those people are that took matters into their own hands and fought on September 11th rather than let that fourth airliner go into the Capitol or go into the White House. Again, when I look at how the destruction of the House of Commons, it's not hard to imagine even more damage to Washington on September 11th but for the bravery of those passengers on that airliner. Well, the bet that Churchill placed on the United States, as it turned out, it was a good one because he found in Roosevelt a partner who also saw the danger from Nazi Germany, who saw this as an ideological fight as well. And so Churchill and Roosevelt, this is going to be one of the great partnerships that's going to lead to the defeat of Nazi Germany. Now, Germany has attacked Britain, it's tried to break Britain, it can't defeat Britain. So what does Hitler do? Well, the next year he attacks the Soviet Union. And today we know the history of what happens and we say, why would he do such a stupid thing? What a foolish thing to do. He did it because of the two scenarios, continue the campaign full bore against Britain or attack the Soviet Union. He thought attacking the Soviet Union was the simpler task. Now, we know otherwise, but again, it shows something about British resistance in 1940, how important that was in shaping Hitler's decisions. He didn't think he could win against Britain. He thought he could only win by first taking the Soviet Union out, and hence he turned against the Soviet Union. Britain's stand, in other words, in 1940, lays the foundation for the Grand Alliance 
that is going to form of the United States, the Soviet Union, and Britain. Britain's stand becomes a rallying point for other countries to stand up against Nazi Germany. And here you see off the coast of Newfoundland in August 1941, Churchill and Roosevelt getting together to do the Atlantic Charter. I like this photograph because the two admirals there are Admiral Ernest King and Admiral Harold Stark. They are both graduates of the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where I teach. So I'm putting in a plug there for my school. It just shows that we contribute to the victory as well in the Second World War. Education leading to a better, educated officer corps capable of making good strategic decisions. Well, there, there's my plug for my school and for my job. Okay, liberators of the world. This is how we remember this partnership. Again, one of the big takeaways is Churchill's bet is that the British people would prove resilient and be willing to fight on. Churchill's bet was also that the United States would come through. Uh, last night, uh, Sir Robert Hardy gave that uh, wonderful rendition of this famous speech on Churchill's 80th birthday. And again, in modesty, Churchill highlights that it was the British people who were resolute, remorseless, and unconquerable. And again, he learned his trade of being a great orator and writer, that he was able to give the lion heart there of the British people, and he had the luck to give the roar. Well, we know that Churchill's contribution was more than just the roar, that his leadership at a critical time was of the utmost importance for making sure that Nazi Germany was indeed defeated, that history didn't turn in that awful way, that our worst imaginations, uh, that those things that we could imagine of how dreadful things could be, did not happen. Thank you very much. So much, Dr. Maurer. We will now have time for one or two questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. Uh, here, uh, in 1938, Neville Chamberlain made his agreement in Munich with Herr Hitler. And Churchill observed then that England was offered a choice between shame and war. They choose shame and would get war. Yes. Just this year, John Kerry went to Vienna to make an agreement with Ayatollah Khomeini. We were offered a choice between shame or war. We, we choose shame. Is there, do you see a church on the horizon that can rescue the Western civilization again? Um, in response to your question, uh, first let me say that, um, and I have to say this so I apologize to you, but I am a government employee and that what I'm going to say uh, does not reflect the opinion of the Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, or the Naval War College. It is only my own personal opinion. But, but I need to say that first. Of course, you would all understand that anyway, but it is a regulation that I am asked to follow. Uh, it is a big question when you're cutting deals with regimes that are revisionist regimes that want to change around the balance of power as Iran does in the Middle East. Uh, cutting deals with them, is that in your interest? Does that make Iran stronger? Uh, anything that moves Iran toward getting nuclear weapons is a danger. Uh, the, the argument often goes something like this, that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, they'll feel more secure and hence they will be less dangerous. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't abide by that. I abide to something simpler and I think more realistic, which is the more powerful some country does, becomes, the more they become ambitious. And so I think a, an Iran armed with nuclear weapons will be more dangerous, not less dangerous. So anything that can be done to impede that should be done. Uh, and uh, indeed, you, when you look at the Middle East, the potential danger there is immense because 
uh, already, you know, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, then what Sunni states might want to get nuclear weapons, maybe working with Pakistan. Uh, you could have a nuclear-armed Middle East, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. How long before that explodes into a nuclear Armageddon there? So, very dangerous environment. Um, I've talked with several of you over lunch. My own view is, I, I don't think we should have signed such a deal. I think we should have continued on to the next presidency. Um, I think it would be good for the U.S. Congress to take a stand against it because it will, at the very least, strengthen the hand of either this president or the next president in what they want to do with Iran. So, uh, having said that, there's arguments on both sides for the agreement, but I think on balance, I, I don't like the agreement. But, um, Good afternoon, sir. I had a question um, regarding the graph you showed us on the, uh, the force of Luftwaffe uh, airplanes and how that was decreasing. Um, yes. Was that just because of the superiority of the British aircraft or were the Germans focusing their manufacturing in other areas over that period of months? I was just curious on why Oops. the numbers were going down so drastically for the Germans. It's training of pilots and production of airframes. And uh, what happened was that Germany, uh, Germany stole a march on Britain by about one year in air rearmament. If Britain had rearmed sooner, uh, you might not have had the catastrophe of France in 1940. So I think Churchill's warnings were were well taken, and if he had been heeded, Britain and France would have been better prepared to fight. What this shows is that Britain is able to train pilots uh, and produce enough airframes to be able to uh, uh, keep ahead of the Germans, who at this time are not keeping a, uh, uh, the same number of trained pilots. In fact, one of the things that's striking, when Hitler attacks the Soviet Union, the German Air Force over the Soviet Union is weaker, weaker, than the German Air Force that attacked France in 1940. So again, the losses suffered by the Luftwaffe in the Battle of France and in the Battle of Britain, and then the air forces that have to be left behind to defend Western Europe against British air assault, means that Germany is less powerful when attacks the Soviet Union. And that could have made a measure of difference of whether the Germans take Moscow and Leningrad or not. So what you have here is a combination of training and production of airframes and forces getting out uh, to the front. These are the best, latest numbers by air historians on this. And it tends to show that the Battle of Britain, as I said, is, was not as close run a thing as um, we often think. Now, having said that, the margin for error here is none too great. Uh, and if you had had a less competent commander than, uh, than Dowding, uh, you, you could have thrown away whatever advantages you're deriving at this time. And of course, the British are pulling out all the stops to maximize air production and training of pilots at this time. Does that get to your, 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 your question? This will be our final question. Mine is related to the previous gentleman. Uh, this is a measurement of pilot, or is this a measurement of aircraft? Uh, of aircraft and, and deployable fighting strength. Okay. Now, I'm wondering how much of that was actually uh, imported from the United States through some sort of a lend-lease program at that time? Uh, not, not at this time. This is British production that's going on. And again, I, I want to highlight that this is just single-engine fighter strength. It doesn't include bombers and, you know, and other measures. So I have singled out you know, one element of air power here uh, in this. If you were to take a larger picture, you would find that the Germans also have a large bomber force. But this is the key indicator of what's going to determine the outcome of the Battle of, of, of Britain. At this time, American aid is not that great. You get the 50 destroyer deal that comes along, lend lease isn't until March 1941. The thinking in Britain is that like the Great War, that Roosevelt has an election looming in 1940. And this is a fascinating story, by the way, because as you know, Roosevelt ran for a third term, an unprecedented third term, breaking the tradition of George Washington of two terms. And in the spring of 1940, before the fall of France, Roosevelt was not, didn't think he had any chance of winning the presidency. Uh, indeed, opinion polls were showing that if he were to run, he would not win a third term. 
But the defeat of France changes around American views. And hence, Roosevelt gets a spike up where he's willing to go if drafted. And so his party does. So the fall of France has a big impact on American domestic politics in enabling the American people to get accustomed to the idea of Roosevelt as the only person that could lead us through this crisis. And hence, he runs uh, successfully for a third term. Now, the British view is until the first Tuesday of November 1940, you're not going to get a firm American policy because Roosevelt, before an election, can't go too far ahead of American opinion. The hope is that maybe in the spring things will change around. As it turns out, as you know, we don't enter the war until December 7th, 1941, when a J Japan attacks us. And then several days later, we get involved in the European war when Hitler declares war on us, which is a fascinating speech to listen to, by the way, to read, uh, uh, in which Hitler lays out in an incredibly revealing way, his ideology and his worldview of how there's this vast conspiracy against him and the German people. Uh, it's a very peculiar uh, speech. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Maurer. Our reception will begin in the Searle Center and dinner thereafter. See you back at 8 o'clock.